It's not okay for you to be a weak loser. It's not okay. And the reason it's not okay is because you could be way more than that. I'm stunned every day when I go outside and it isn't a, r a riot with everything burning. Because really, God, you talk to people, it's like, I knew this guy, he'd been in a motorcycle accident and it really ruined him. And he was like a linesman, you know, working on the power. And he was working with someone who had Parkinson's disease and they had complementary inadequacies. And so two of them could do the job of one person. And so they're out there fixing power lines in the freezing cold, despite the fact that one was three quarters wrecked with a motorcycle accident and the other one had Parkinson's. It's like, that's how our civilization works. It's like, there's all these ruined people out there. They've got problems like you can't believe. Off they go to work and do things they don't even like. And look, the lights are on. My God, it's unbelievable. It's, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. Well, there's a deep idea in the West too. It's like, pick up your damn suffering and bear it. And try to be a good person so you don't make it worse. Well, that's a truth, you know. Set your house in order. That's rule six in, the, in, the, in this book. So I have a book rule in there that says, set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. And it's a very dark chapter about the motivations of the Columbine High School killers and this other guy named Carl Panzram, who was a serial rapist and arsonist and murderer. And these, he wrote an autobiography, and the Columbine kids also wrote about why they did what they did. They're resentful to the core, bitter, bitter, resentful, terrible. And, well, I'm suggesting that people stay away from that resentment, resentfulness and bitterness, even though life is hard and, it, and, it, and there's malevolence in the world. It's like, yeah, you can, you can tell a story where everyone's a victim, because we all die, we all get sick, you know? And, and, and things happen to us that are bitter and terrible, betrayal, deceit, lies, like people hurt us on purpose, you know? So it's not just the tragedy of life, it's malevolence as well. It's everyone's a victim. You can tell that story. The problem is if you tell that story and you start to act it out, you make all of that worse. You have a lots of reasons to be, God, there's reasons to be resentful about your existence. Everyone you know is gonna die, you know, you too. And there's going to be a fair bit of pain along the way, and lots of it's going to be unfair. It's like, yeah, no wonder you're resentful. It's like, act it out and see what happens. You make everything you're complaining about infinitely worse. There's this idea that hell is a bottomless pit, and that's because no matter how bad it is, some stupid son of a bitch like you could figure out a way to make it a lot worse. So you think, well, what do you do about that? Well, you accept it. That's what life is like. It's suffering. That's what the religious people have always said. Life is suffering. Yes. Well, who wants to admit that? Well, just think about it. Well, so what do you do in the face of that suffering? Try to reduce it. Start with yourself. What good are you? Get yourself together for Christ's sake so that when your father dies, you're not whining away in a corner and you can help plan the funeral and you can stand up solidly so that people can rely on you. That's better. Don't be a damn victim. Of course you're a victim, obviously. Put yourself together. And then maybe if you put yourself together, you know how to do that. You know what's wrong with you, if you'll admit it. You know there's a few things you could like polish up a little bit that you might even be able to manage in your insufficient present condition. And so you might shine yourself up a little bit and then your eyes will be a little more open and then you can shine yourself up a little bit more and then maybe you could bring your family together instead of having them be the hateful, spiteful, neurotic, infighting batch that you're like doomed to spend Christmas with. So then you fix yourself up a little bit, kind of humbly, because, you know, God, you're a fixer-upper if there ever was one. And then you got to figure out, well, can you figure out how to make peace with your idiot brother? And probably not, because he's just as dumb as you, so how the hell are you going to manage that? And so then you, maybe you get somewhere that way, and your family's sort of functioning, and you find out, well, that kind of relieved a little bit of suffering, although it reduced the opportunities for spiteful revenge, and that's kind of a pain in the neck. And so then you get your family together a little bit, and you're a little clued in then, at least a bit, because you've done something difficult that's actually difficult. You're a little wiser, and so then maybe you could put a tentative finger out beyond the family and try to change some little thing without wrecking it. 
And it's, so this is why partly I got attracted to Christian imagery, at least in part. Because um, there's an idea in Christianity that you should pick up your goddamn cross and like walk up the hill. And that's dramatically, that's correct. That's the right answer. It's like, you've got a heavy load of suffering to bear and a fair bit of it's going to be unjust. So what are you going to do about it? Accept it voluntarily and try to transform as a consequence. That's the right answer. You might be noticing that the LGBT set of acronyms keeps growing, eh? And it, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of a form of its own parody in some sense. It's like, well, I'm oppressed. It's like, yeah, yeah, you are. And well, well I'm oppressed too. Yeah, you're also oppressed. And maybe I'm even oppressing you being part of this other marginalized group, but at least we share our oppression. Well, I'm also oppressed. Well, so am I, I'm oppressed too. It's like, okay, so here's a problem. There's a big problem here. The problem is, it's true. You're oppressed, you're oppressed, you're oppressed, you're oppressed. God only knows why. Maybe you're too short or you're not as beautiful as you could be, or you know, your parent, your grandparent was a serf, likely, because almost everybody's grand great grandparent was. It's like, you know, and you're not as smart as you could be, and you have a sick relative, and you have your own physical problems, and it's like, frankly, you're a mess. And you're oppressed in every possible way, including your ancestry and your biology. And the entire sum of human history has conspired to produce victimized you with all your individual pathological problems. It's like, yes, true. Okay, but the problem is, is that it is true. And so if you take the oppressed, you have to fractionate them and fractionate them. It's like, you're a woman. Yeah, okay, well, I'm a black woman. Well, I'm a black woman who has two children. Well, I'm a black woman who has two children and one of them isn't very healthy. And then, well, I'm a, I'm a Hispanic woman and I have a genius son who doesn't have any money so that he can't go to university. And, you know, I had a hell of a time getting across the border. It was really hard on me to get my citizenship. My husband is an alcoholic brute. It's like, well, yeah, that sucks too. And so, well, so let's, let's, let's fix all your oppressive oppression. And we'll take every single thing into account, and then we'll fix yours too. We'll take every single thing into account. It's like, no, you won't, because you can't. You can't. It is technically impossible. When Adam and Eve become self-conscious, the scales from, fall from their eyes. They realize that they're naked. And to realize that you're naked is to understand your vulnerability. That's why Adam and Eve clothed themselves right away. Oh no, I'm naked. I can be hurt. Okay, I can be hurt. I have to clothe myself. I have to protect myself in the future. You actually become aware of that in a way that animals aren't. Well, what does it mean that you're naked? It means that everyone else is too. Yeah. What does it mean that you can be hurt? It means that everyone else can be hurt too. It means that you could hurt them. And that's why the knowledge of good and evil goes along with the knowledge of nakedness. That took me a long time to figure out. It took me about 30 years to figure that out. So why are those two things conjoined? Oh yes, when you understand that you're vulnerable, you understand that everyone else is vulnerable, and then you have the option of exploiting that. And so that, that's what transforms human beings to some degree from animals, because a predator just eats you. But a human being, a human being can play with you and will for all sorts of reasons. Now, the capacity to do that though, why is the capacity to do that, let's say, useful? Well, it's useful to be strong and not to have to use it. That reflects something that we talked about earlier because it makes you formidable. And I think that you have to be formidable in order to move forward properly in the world, even to get through obstacles that aren't, just to get through obstacles. You have to have some strength of character. You have to have some commitment. And some of that is there will be a cost if you interfere with me. It'll be the minimal cost necessary. Let's say if, you're, if you've got yourself under control. It will be the minimal cost necessary. But do not be thinking there won't be a cost. And I don't think, I don't believe that if that's not built into your character, then you have, you have no strength. And you certainly have no strength when you're pushed by someone who's malevolent. A bully, if you're like that, if the bully pushes you and your response is, there will be a cost for pushing me and you will pay it, then the bully will go elsewhere. And we know that too from studies of bullies, you know, like even ch childhood bullies, they push around they kids and then they find the ones that retreat and withdraw and they bully them. 
So, and you know, you might think, well, usually children are bullied because of some abnormality. That's a very common idea. It's like, there's a guy named Dan Olwys, a very smart Norwegian psychologist, and he studied bullying for a long time as a precursor to fascism, by the way, so that was his interest. He said, his analysis indicated that at least three quarters of children have some obvious abnormality that could be the focus of bullying attention. It might even be your name. It doesn't take much of a genius bully to come up with a good way of making fun of your name. Or you're too tall or you're too short or, you know, or, or your brother's too tall or too short or there's something. It isn't the abnormality that is the cause of the bullying. It's the abnormality might become the focus of the bullying, but part of the cause is the withdrawal in the face of the bullies, because the bully thinks he can get away with it. Well, if, if you're, and it's also the case with children who are preyed upon by adult predators. Like adult predators of children look for children who are easily cowed and who won't put up a fight. So for example, if you're teaching your children to be terrified of strangers, that's really not a very good strategy. You want kids who are confident and who will make a noise if someone messes about with them and who are, who are, who are, and so that, that, that characterological strength has to be built in 